and welcome to episode 15 of Footnotes and Fairy Tales with me, Damien Fox, the platform that hopes to showcase the people of Newry and their stories. My guest today is an immensely talented artist. Having lived in Australia for the best part of a decade, she made the decision to move home to Newry to open her own studio, making art readily accessible to everyone and anyone. Her business is enjoying immense success, so much so that the Great Inuri Business Award shortlisted her for Best Young Businesswoman and her studio for the Best Innovative Business. I'm delighted to introduce to you today Frankie Bannon. Hi, Frankie. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Uh, thanks for having me on, Damien. Um, I'd listened to a podcast that you'd done recently, and it, it served two purposes. One was to try and understand a bit more about you. Um, so it was helpful in that respect, but what it ultimately did was filled in a lot of the blanks already. So instinctively, I thought to myself, I don't want to ask the same questions because not only is that going to be perhaps repetitive and a little boring for you, but also it's not something I want to do because it's the curiosity that kind of motivates me to want to talk to people and interview them. So I've decided to kind of redirect the interview a little bit away from the business and kind of look at you as the artist. Yeah, um, which is exciting for me. Yeah. Um, I will talk about the business because it is exciting and it's something that Nuri has been long, longing for, I would imagine, for a long time. It didn't have something like that available. Um, but yeah. if I go back to the beginning, you talked about you being the child in the family or the artist in the family and you'd held a paintbrush from as, as long as you can remember. Mm -hmm. what, what, what was it about art that you can remember that, I don't know, captured your imagination? Well, I think I was lucky enough to grow up in a house where my mom was very into art and she sort of nurtured that creativity in me, also with my other sisters as well. But I think the draw for it with me was the fact that I could just put down paper and pens and paint and just run amok and just let my creativity go wild. It wasn't, you didn't have to sit at a desk the way that you did if you were reading or writing or learning anything else. So it was just the freedom of expression, I think, as a really small child that I found, you know, most exciting about it. And was that to be said if you throw out early school and then on into high school? Because my experience uh, of art in high school was just something that had to be done, you know, like music or it wasn't, I don't know if it was a case that it just didn't interest me or that how it's kind of laid out for, for, for young people in school just isn't appealing. You know, is it, um, is that, is that a fault of the system? What was your experience in high school with art? I think it's a bit of both. Um, I obviously had a very different uh, feeling towards art in terms of, you know, it wasn't something that I had to get done. I loved going into art. Um, that was the one thing when I looked on my timetable every year when we got our new timetables, I was like, oh, yes, but, you know, art on a Monday or art on a Friday. It did really excite me. But there is definitely that side of it where they restrict what you can do. Um, I find that a lot when I took it on for A-level especially. I always wanted to come up with the final concept. And um, my teachers kept saying, no, 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 you have to work to your final concept. You have to start off with this idea and then you've developed it and then you've done the next, like show all of the steps. So I would always work backwards. I would do the end project and then try and fill the gaps in because that's the boxes I had to tick for the curriculum. Um, so I think in some ways it does really restrict you, but I suppose in a school setting, that's how it has to be. They want to know the same as a math question. How did you get your answer? How did you get there? You have to show your, your working out, your finding. Um, and I really find that struggle when I went to university because I think with the dissertation and all of the stuff that comes with it, it sort of takes the fun away from creating a lot of the time. If I could just touch again about, upon my own experience, and you can perhaps relate to this. The idea in high school was... If you couldn't draw, if essentially you're not good at art, is is our perception mm -hmm. of art at that age wrong? In that your ability to draw something is that ultimately determines how good you are at art. Yes, I think so. Um, I think in schools they look at art in a very linear way, so that drawing is the only skill that you need to have, especially as a young child. They'll say, "Oh, you're really good at drawing," or "You're not so good at drawing," and they sort of 
pigeonhole you or put you into these sort of two boxes. And then children grow up with that belief of I'm very good or I'm not very good. If you look at very young children, um, children that are, are nursery or haven't yet gone to school, they don't really care about what they're drawing, what they're creating. They just create for the love and the joy of it. And all children do that. And then they, they build up a complex as they get older just because school have told them, you're not quite good at this. Why don't you look at something else? When art can take many different forms, it doesn't have to be traditional of drawing and painting. There's a lot of abstract art out there. There is a lot of emotive painting, as it's called. Um, there's even just in looking at literature and music and even cooking, there's all different ways to create. So I think that, yes, telling a child um, you're, you're not quite good at drawing means that you're terrible at art is the sort of wrong approach to take. If you were to, to change how things are done, what would you inject into, into art in school to, in order that people are, I guess, more readily willing to, to pursue it and enjoy it? I think, um, and it might sound, you know, a bit um, happy, but looking at art in a more meditative way of saying to people, you know, enjoy the process. How does it make you feel? Get into a flow state. That's what we do in a lot of the workshops at the studio is about people just enjoying the process of being creative and sort of detaching from all the stuff that you have to do for the day. So I think if they allow children to use it in that form to be like, okay, we're going to create just for the sake of creating and see what comes out about it, that could open up bigger discussions in a class. So if everybody was able to create something and then discuss why they've created that, how did it make them feel, do it more in an art therapy sort of style as opposed to okay guys so the curriculum is telling us that we need to create four paintings mm -hmm. this month and this is the theme um i think that that really restricts children so doing it in that way or saying to a child what did you like most about creating that and if it isn't in the drawing aspect of it or the painting is it just in the doing of it itself and can they find a different outlet so it could be the music it could be the cooking it could even be landscape gardening do you know, it could be something as simple as that of, okay, we have a creative mind here, but we don't have to tell them that it needs to be in the format of art and design that we teach just in school. Mm -hmm. So I think that sort of really needs to change. Um, and I think taking in different artists through different practices to teach children. I know when I was in school, we did have a ceramicist that came in and she showed us a little bit of her pottery and her, her different artwork. But outside of that, we didn't really have a lot of different artists that came in. Um, again, whether that was traditional art or musicians or anything like that, I think giving kids a little taster, getting them out of school settings to go into businesses such as mine and see creatives that have done their own thing, I think would be very eye-opening for a lot of children. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if we look at where art's right now, and you can probably testify to this more than anyone, I would imagine art's very progressive and edgy, Whereas if you look at schooling and art in schools, it's very conventional, you know, mm -hmm. there's something in front of you trying to pick that on a page. Um, I think everything that you've said would be wonderful if there was schools were able to facilitate that and certainly look at it. Um, when you went on then, I suppose, into A level and looked into the future in terms of college, did you have a clear idea of, of where you were gonna go? Was art something that you wanted to pursue in that respect? Yeah, I've always wanted to do art. It was never a question. Um, that was my main goal. But I think obviously, thankfully, times have changed quite a bit since then. And there's a lot of, you know, digital art and different ways that people can, you know, be creative without having to go down the traditional art route. Mm -hmm. When I was doing my A-levels, I was sat down with a careers advisor. And when I look back at it now, this lady was probably close to retirement. So she was probably the most attached teacher in terms of what was happening out in the workforce there mm -hmm. um you know it would have been different if it was maybe a newly graduated teacher that had just come through university and really understood what was happening um but I was sort of told don't do painting don't go and do any of those sort of you know fine art degrees you'll never make money in it um so I was given a list of a very tiny list I think there was like four different options of degrees that would suit what I wanted to do and fashion and textile was kind of the one that I was um, pushed towards. I mean, obviously, I, I had an option of like 
I think it was four from memory, but fashion and textile design was the one that was going to potentially give me a job on the other side of working in a design house or working as a fashion buyer, something where I could actually make money at the end of my degree, as opposed to going in what I was told, if you do a fine art degree, you're just going to come out having a degree in painting and you're never going to be able to get a job anywhere. So um, that was the advice that I was given. I did do that degree for four years and I didn't really enjoy it. I did it just for the sake of having the degree. Um, and I kind of thought I'll figure it out when I leave uni and some sort of job will come through it. So that was my thinking on it at the time. Do, do you think that's unhealthy in so much as that we're steered away from art by the schooling system in terms of career advice? And even in my own experience, I mean, if I were to pitch to my parents that I wanted to pursue art, you know, Obviously, they're looking out for your best interest, so they would think practically that's probably not a good choice in terms of a career and, and you know, finding yeah. something that's going to bring a regular income and security. But I think to the detriment of all of us is that we're being steered away from the arts to some degree. Yeah, I think um, I was, again, very lucky that my parents have always been, for me and my sisters, very supportive in anything that we wanted to do. So if one of us had said, you know, we're going to, leave and join the circus they'd be like you're happy and you want to do it go and do it sort of thing and um, they really encouraged us I do know a lot of girls that were very interested in art in school and their parents were like nope you're going to be you know doing a degree a proper degree as they would call it and they would say you know you're going to become a doctor you're going to do law you're going to do x y and z so I mean one I was very lucky in that respect but I do think that it is a very old age view um that we need to dispel that you know if you go down the creative route in any pursuit, that it's not going to work out. But I also do think that the education system is fairly broken in terms of when my parents, when my mom went to uni, university was very prestigious. Not a lot of people had a degree and anyone that had a degree was guaranteed a job at the end of it. Whereas now everybody has the access to a degree, which is great in a lot of ways, but also, you know, is the downfall because everyone's on the same footing it doesn't matter even if you come out sometimes with a medical degree you're starting way down the bottom and you're still having to work and climb all the way up so a job's not necessarily guaranteed so I think in that respect if you are a creative and your parents are saying to you I want you to do x y and z I want you to do as we would say a proper degree it also isn't worth the paper that it's written on. Go out and do what you yeah. actually love doing and you'll find a way to make money from it. You will. Do you, think, do you think that old age view has been proven wrong now? We see this, um, I, don't know if, I don't know if this resurgence is the word for it, um, but this wave of um, artists, you know, studios, um, artists and markets, you know, people putting their work online. I mean, to my knowledge, it seems to be growing in strength Definitely. and pe pe people are finding a way to make an income. Yeah, for sure. If you look at the likes of Etsy, for example, you know, that sort of catapulted really small artists that were, had a hobby passion and decided to turn it into their full-time or sideline business. Um, I think that there's even more emphasis now on things that are handmade, local made, artisan as you said whether it be carpentry you know mm -hmm. we kind of looked at vocational jobs as a step down from a degree maybe 15 years ago you had people that went into hairdressing and makeup and that was seen as you know your vocation and that was okay you went to tech but you were never going to make great money on it where is we have makeup artists now that are making hundreds of thousands yeah. probably millions some of them a year um that are content creators as well you've got people my own hairdresser who has i think like sixty thousand followers on instagram and he flies all over the world to do hair tutorials and and train other hairdressers so i think that thankfully we have seen a massive shift in anyone that has gone down that more vocational creative route has really paved a way for you know the younger generation coming behind to do even more exciting things like content creation what didn't even exist when mm -hmm. I was growing up 
um, the internet was still the AOL dial-up tone where someone had to get <laughs> off the phone line so you could use the computer. We didn't have all this in you know in your hands. I'm starting to sound really old here, but I think there has been a massive shift um, for you know for the, the greater good of everybody else. I think in that way, no matter what your passion is, as I said, if you want to work hard enough at it, you'll be able to make money from it. Mm-hmm. If I can move on then, obviously having come out with the degree, um, you decided, uh, maybe you could explain how long after that you decided to move to Australia. Um, you had said in the interview previously that I listened to in that podcast that, I don't know, there was just something in your, I don't know if claustrophobic was the word that you'd used, um, but you had felt the need to, to spread your wings and uh, experience something else. Yeah, um, so it was fairly... Um, short time frame after I finished uni. I think after I graduated, maybe about six, six or eight months after that, yeah, I decided to go to Australia by myself. I yeah, I did find Newry was very claustrophobic. I think it was Northern Ireland in general. Um, it was just very grey and dull, and you know there wasn't much going on. I think because potentially I had done my degree in Belfast, so I hadn't been in London. London or I hadn't really experienced anything outside of Northern Ireland um, I'm lucky enough that I'm half Australian my mum's from Australia so I had the passport I just thought you know what I'll head over for six months I'll go and check it out see what it's all about and then came back eight and a half years later um, so yeah that's what happened there I wanted to know um, and this is not an easy quest- question to answer but let's say that you didn't make that decision to move to Australia do you, do you think your life would have taken you along this, not necessarily the same path, but to the same point where you're at now? No. And I have thought, I've given this a lot of thought myself over the years. I think traveling for anybody really expands you as a person, come into different cultures that you would never come into contact with. Um, I think Nuri had a culture shock when, you know, loads of Polish people moved over like 20 years ago. Um, and it's lovely to see that when I came back, that Nuri is now a melting pot of different cultures and um, ethnicities, which is so good. And it adds to the vibrancy of every culture, you know, with your food and the heritage that they bring with them. But um, yeah, traveling really expanded my mind. So I got to meet, as I said, like lots of different people, different backgrounds, ethnicities, cultures. I think you learn as well to stand on your own two feet. You know, if you're stuck, not stuck, that's probably a really bad word to use, but I think if you stay at home for a very extended period of time, you do become very closed in. Mm-hmm. It's great that you have your, your family and your friends there from when you were a child, but you're not really stretching, developing yourself um, or testing yourself as well. So you think that was a necessary life experience in order that you became the artist, the businesswoman and the person that you are today? Definitely. I think the art thing was always there with me. And funnily enough, when I went to Australia, I didn't do any art for the first seven, eight years that I was there. Um, I think that part of me was always sort of waiting to come back. But in terms of business acumen, I was working as an area manager for a clothing company over there. I was overseeing 22 stores and about 175 staff. I wouldn't have the capacity to do that in Northern Ireland. There wouldn't have been a brand possibly big enough um, mm. and if there was I mean those jobs would have been you know very hard to get I would imagine so I think that part of it really developed me into the businesswoman that I am I don't think that I would have had maybe the confidence in in myself to open a business if I had just stayed here and sort of just you know plodded along and worked in a different job or even if I had have worked my way up in a career here I probably then would have found that I would have left here to go and set up somewhere else. So I would imagine that if I had started in a business in Northern Ireland and worked my way up, like most um, Northern Irish businesses, they have links to London or other parts of the UK, possibly would have ended up somewhere there instead of setting the business up here. You, and I read this, um, either you were approached or you approached, I'm not sure, um, uh, school in Australia that they then brought you in to help um, with children? Yes. So uh, what had happened was I actually went to an art workshop myself, a mm-hmm. resin workshop because I'd never worked with resin. And the lady there had said to me, it was sort of halfway through 
um, working on this piece and she said are you an artist by any chance and I laughed and I said well maybe in another life I haven't done it in quite a long time and we got chatting and she said to me well I'm actually running a program in a Sydney school and I need another artist to help me facilitate it would it be something that you're interested in and I thought about it I'd worked with children in the past in Ireland before I left to go to Australia and I thought you know what why not I'll do it for I think it was six weeks or eight weeks I went in and spoke to my boss and said, look, um, there's going to be one day a week that I need to finish like an hour early, but I'll pick up, you know, extra time, that sort of thing. My boss was looking at me as if I'm crazy. She's like, why do you want to work in a, a kid's school for, you know, doing workshops? So I did that for the um, six weeks or eight weeks. And then, yeah, I knew after that that I wanted to start working again, create an art and sort of showcase an art to the younger generation. So I handed him my notice and, and I left. Was there any sense of panic when you made that decision to step away from a career that you'd established to try something that perhaps was new and unfounded territory? Uh, yeah, but the panic didn't set until after. <laughs> that's, probably a, that's probably a good thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think it was about a week and a half after I'd actually quit my job and I thought, God, what have I done? What have I done? I've no, I've no income coming in. This all sounded great at the time, um, and then I think I did panic because I thought you haven't really thought about this. You've no business. Well, I did have a business plan, but it was a very weak business plan at this point. It was just more of an idea. Um, I was like, right, the money has stopped coming in. What is your actual plan here? So uh, yeah, that definitely did happen. The the reason I asked about that experience with with the school children in Australia because I wanted to understand if that experience helped shape the business model in so much as your art studio wouldn't just be a place to showcase your art, but that would be, it would be a platform, a space, you know, an inclusive space to let anybody come in. Um, did, did that experience help shape that model? It did, but I also had earlier experiences that um, sort of cemented that in. As I said at the beginning, my mum uh, was quite creative as well, um, especially when we were growing up. Uh, my mum's a social worker now, but 25 years before then, my mum used to run art workshops for children in Newry. Okay. And I used to go and help my mum from, I was like maybe five or six. It was obviously, mum had to bring me along to work. It was on a Saturday. There'd be 30, 40 children coming in. Um, and then when I was 17, I would take the younger kids in the class. So mom would sort of break them up into two groups and I would have the younger kids. And I sort of was like running my own like mini class within her workshops. Um, and then my mom decided to quit that and go to uni to study, to become a social worker. And all the parents of these kids were like, what do you mean that you're not doing the art classes anymore? Um, and I yeah, just turned 18 and mom said, oh, right, okay. So I decided then to run the art workshops for two years. I'm um, just taking over the kids that mum had already sort of built up that client base. And I did that at the start of my uni degree. So I think when I went back and I was working with that Sydney school, it all sort of came flooding back. Uh, it was like second nature to me. I was like, oh, yeah, this is really easy. I can do this. No problem. And um, so, yeah, when I decided that I was going to do the art studio, it was always going to be not so much an art gallery, but definitely the art studio to, you know, have it inclusive, make sure that people of all walks of life, so from children all the way up into adulthood, um, whether it's the elderly as well, everyone had a chance to try art, um, to just you know express themselves, let go and enjoy it. When you decided to, to start the business, what was the, the main motivation for starting the business in Uri as opposed to perhaps remaining in Australia and, and doing it there? Well, what had actually happened was I registered the business in Sydney and I was looking at premises and I was trying to sort of sort all that kind of background stuff out. But I hadn't had a Christmas back in Ireland in nine years. So I thought, you know what, for once I'm going to go home for Christmas. I'd obviously been home in between that, but it just hadn't been at Christmas time. So I came home and all of my sister's, like live abroad as well so I think my parents were just really happy that one of us was home for Christmas um, and my dad kind of said to me he's like why don't you give the business a go here you know you're renting out a house in Australia your rent as in the lease was coming off I think 
three months, four months later, he was like, you could try it out here. And he was really trying his best to convince me to stay. And I said, no, no, I'm, go I'm going to do it in Sydney. I registered the business there. And my dad was like, yeah, but you know, you'll have loads of support over here. You've got friends and family. And he was really laying it on thick for me. And he said to me, why don't you give it a year in Newry? If it works, it works. If it doesn't go back and then you haven't really lost anything. And the more that I thought about it, Newry hadn't like, yes, it was great. There were things happening in Newry, but it was still about 10 years behind as small towns are behind everywhere else. So I thought, you know what, he's right. I will give it a go here. It's actually really lacking. There's nothing happening in terms of the arts. I'll give it a go. And if it takes off, I'll stay. And if it doesn't, I'll go back. And I think part of me thought that it wasn't going to work out, um, which was good in a way, because I think it gave me the freedom to like really go for it and not feel embarrassed in a way, you know, posting stuff up or trying to do things if they weren't right. I think when you're trying to obviously get a business going, you want it to be perfect from the outset. And I kind of thought, ah, oh, do you know what? It's a year. I'll give it a go. And if I really mess it up, I can just jump back on a plane and disappear and everyone will forget about it in a while. And um, so that in a way was probably quite good because it gave me the freedom to just chuck a load of ideas out there and see which one sort of stuck. So I read on your website that the business um, started in 2019. Mm -hmm. Did the studio start at the same time or had the business preceded that? No. So um, what had happened was when I had obviously come home at that point and decided to start doing workshops, I wanted to sort of slowly build up the clientele. As I said, I wanted to throw different ideas out there and see what was going to stick. So I started with acrylic pour, which is like a fluid art nowhere in north actually all of ireland north and south from what i could find i did a lot of research nobody was doing workshops of that and i thought that'll be the one so i started to do those workshops um and i started to run sort of like mini painting tip events and i was just renting out i actually did the first acrylic pour workshops at my parents house in their front sort of living room it's actually the space that i'm sitting in now um it's a fairly big room and it used to be a living room and I stripped it all out and made it into an art studio for the first year that I was home. And um, yeah, I ran a few workshops here. Obviously I had no money coming in because I'd quit the job in Australia. I was still paying rent in Australia for a few months and I decided to get a job in Dublin to pay bills. I didn't want to take out any massive loans. I didn't want to borrow money off family and friends. And I thought I'll build it up slowly I'll do one or two workshops a week. I'll work the other five days and I'll just see how it goes. So that was why it started in 2019 um, because I was actually working full time. And then a year in COVID hit anyway. So I was fairly glad that I had a job and mm. got furloughed. So that kind of took the pressure off a bit. And it meant that I could turn all my workshops onto online classes. I give a lot of those away for free. Um we connected people all over the world, people in the States and people in Australia that were logging in to do online paint and sips from home. So obviously everybody was, you know, closed in and bored out of their minds and did a lot of um, art workshops for children over that period of time, over that year, just so that parents could say, you know what, get onto the laptop, here's all the art materials, and they could just, you know, paint with me or create stuff with me in real time. So the business was slowly built up in the first two years and it got to the point where I was working seven days a week for two years non-stop it was a lot um I remember driving up and down to Dublin and I actually pulled over at the Apple Green petrol station and cried because I was so tired I was like <laughs> why am I doing this I'm so tired and it was the only reason I was crying was because I was exhausted but I knew inside me, I was like, if you push through this and you keep going, it's going to get better and you're going to be able to quit the job. The business will take off. So it started to get to the point where calls were coming in and emails were coming in looking for bookings for hand parties and corporate events. And I thought, God, I'm working that day in Dublin. And I thought, I can't keep turning down business because they're going to start going elsewhere. So mm -hmm. I then went in and handed in my notice in Dublin and, um, just decided to bite the bullet, find the studio. It all just started to slot into place. And I got moved into the studio. It'll be coming up for a year in November. 
this year sorry two years in November so um yeah we're almost in there two years and ever since we opened the doors it's been flat out like five six sometimes seven days a week of art workshops that are just you know constantly going and then in between that I try and find times to do my own artwork so yeah I wanted to understand because I'm sure it has or someone has to have a certain set of character traits you know, in order that they set aside maybe insecurity and even though they're under immense pressure that they pursue, in, in your case, perhaps even relentlessly, that passion. Um, mm-hmm. What character traits in you think help shape the person you are and have ultimately got, got you where, where you are right now with the business? Like, what is it in you particularly? I think it's determination and grit. Um, I've said it a few times from speaking this morning, Damien, that if you love something and you have the drive and the passion to do it, that you'll make money from it. And if you listen to anyone that has a business or anyone that's an entrepreneur, because I love to listen to those types of podcasts as well, people will always tell you that money is a byproduct of what you love to do. Okay, If you're only chasing money, it's, it's not going to work. So I think for me, it was definitely determination, drive, the passion for wanting to create something. So yes, it's nice to sit down and paint a pretty painting. And some people might just want to do that as a hobby and that's okay. They find it as a way to relax. And they're, they're my clients that come in. They want to come in every month and do a paint and sip and relax. For me, creating something and putting art out into the world was a massive driving force for me. I just want to keep creating. I get really excited about it. I have dreams about, like I dream about paintings and they're in my dreams. It sounds really weird, but it'll like haunt me for nearly a month. It'll just keep coming through in a dream. And I'm like, right, I have to paint this. I have to, it's like, I have to physically get it out of my body. So I think that's where that drive and passion and determination comes through in my character traits. Um, I think that as well, being personable, like I love chatting to people. Mm. I'm love getting to know people I think that works really well when you're in business because again if you're only there for the money people can feel that it's transactional if you're just like yep you know come in and spend money with me or buy a product from me unless you have something amazing in terms of a product that nobody else can provide people are going to go elsewhere people want to be around you if they know that you genuinely care about them if you genuinely want to hear about you know, what they're doing, how their day is going, how they're developing in their skill. I have clients that come in to me every month and they get the phone out and they're showing me the artwork that they've created in between classes. I have one lady that's converted her attic into like her own art gallery and studio. And that was from the last two years of doing, actually she's been coming to me for three years um, doing painting workshops. So I think those sort of characteristics of mine have helped shape and develop the business in a massive way and I think they've helped to shape also the clients that I I bring in to the business as well I want to ask because yes there is a need there for for you to be an artist and, and certainly a quite good one because that instills confidence in the people that are coming to you that you know what you're doing that you're very good at what you're doing but that in and of itself isn't enough to drive a successful business. Art's one aspect of it, but Mm -hmm. hard work, that work ethic is equally important, if not perhaps more so to drive your business. Mm -hmm. How much would, like if you were to quantify, Mm -hmm. I'm a successful artist, uh, takes up this much, but how much then is the rest, you know, hard work? Is it the bigger part? Yeah, I think, well, Art for me is um, natural for me. I, it's not something that I necessarily have to work at. It just, it, I find it very easy to do. Um, so that part of it is a very small portion of, of it. I think that the hard work and the behind the, the scenes for any business is 99% of everything that you do. I mean, yes, I might as an artist myself, I'll create a painting, but then outside of that, people don't understand that, okay, there's all the marketing that went into that. There's photographing the artwork. If you want to, you know, 
produce it and make it into scans. It's working with your framer to understand what kind of framing that needs to go into. I know that sounds like a very simple thing to do, but it's actually not. Um, it's working out the branding for your your label. It's working on your website design. It's sending out the emails to your customers so that the you know they're getting updates and they feel like they're being valued. It's about finding your market out there and getting to the people that want to buy your work um, or come to a class. There's the days where you, you have a breakdown <laughs> and cry in your car and you have to try and get past that. Um, yeah, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in every single business. I think that that's 99% of it. And the artwork is, is the smaller, it's the shiny bit at the end that everybody else sees and it's the bit that draws them in. I read a quote by uh, Picasso, and it's something, and it relates to something that you had said. Um, he had said that he dreamed of painting, and then he painted what he dreamed. Um, yeah. So, in that respect, how much of your mind is consumed by the creative and by the need to paint, and how much of your time spent thinking? Like, yes, there's there's a real business and a business need. But ultimately, the driving force is is you, the artist. So, how much of your day is like, like I think about art, and this is what I want to paint. Yeah, um. So every single day, I think of creating something, painting something. Obviously, time restricts that, and the business does restrict that quite a bit because you're doing other things and you can't always be creating. Um, some days are more. I am more consumed by it than others. And it's not always on the days that you want it to be. <laughs> so it's normally on the days when you've got so much going on that I'm like, I really want to do that. And it's almost, it's like an itch that I have to scratch. And that's why I'm saying that if I ignore it as a dream, it just keeps building up and building up and building up. And it gets to a point where I'm like, right, I really need to sit down and I have to paint this or create it because it's been bothering me now for so long. But it depends. There's a lot of factors. It depends on where I am. So if I'm out a lot of the time in nature, um, I'm outdoors, I'm walking around, I'm in silence, or if I'm listening to really good music, that can be the catalyst to get things going. I think as a creative, maybe our brains work a little bit differently to everybody else's because I will look at certain things. I'll look at even colours of stuff as I'm just walking past. And I'm like, that colour would go really well in a painting with this and this. So my brain is always trying to cut, like put together paintings colorways options and that's it's like a tab that hasn't been closed and it's always going off in the background in a loop it's never fully off um so yeah that's kind of how my my brain thinks but it different days it consumes more than others but it's always there always there how, how much of what you envisage ultimately makes it uh, to the canvas and are, are you very often or do you very often fall short? Um, I would say maybe only about 20 percent because, again, life gets in the way. So there will be certain elements or certain paintings, as I said, that build up that I constantly dream of to the point where I'm like, oh, right, I need I need to do this. They're the 20 percent that make it onto the canvas. Um, outside of that, as I said, it's always a tab that's not closed and it's fully looped and it's just going off all the time. So I don't get the time to create absolutely every single thing that I want to create. Outside of that, I am also a business owner. So I have to think commercially about what I'm going to create. Um, or it might be for a client in particular. So I do a lot with a, a local whiskey brand in Uri called Two Stacks created murals for them and limited edition artwork for their whiskey bottles. So again, that's down to the client themselves, you know, what the color options, yes, I'll give my input, but they, they have the, the overarching um, say on that um, of what they want. So some of it is steered in that direction. If I'm maybe creating an artwork or a print, I have to look at it and be like, is this gonna be commercially viable? Are people gonna wanna paint it? And then sometimes I do create things that are just for me. There's a lot of artwork that I've created. I mean, canvas upon canvas that people have never seen. And that is just for me purely to get that feeling of art and what 
is in my head out onto canvas and it doesn't always work out in my head I might be like this is going to work this is going to be really good and then I paint it and it's not how I envis envisaged it yeah. to look um and that's okay it doesn't always have to be great but sometimes it just needs to um serve the purpose of actually just creating it for the sake of it you know? yeah that's that's what I wanted to understand because I've made attempts to write many different things and very often what what you had envisaged in, in your mind doesn't always translate to the page. Uh, and mm -hmm. I'd want to understand, you know, when you dream about a painting, how much of what you've dreamt makes it to the canvas and are you very often satisfied or how, was the dream ultimately better than the reality? Sometimes. And I think that, well, that's the same in life, you know, that's why they call them dreams. You know, yeah. we can imagine vast things in our heads and when we actually try and put it you know to paper or um it's it's not always how you've imagined it but I think in some cases that's nearly the nice thing because it's the human part of us you know I think when we dream about things when you dream you dream about really obscure things that can't happen I mean I dream about flying sometimes <laughs> it's not reality okay but it's a nice thought but it's not going to happen so I think when we try to pull that out of our dreams and put it down in writing in painting and we fall short, I kind of find it comforting in the fact that we are human and that is our human bodies trying our best to translate that out. And that's okay that it doesn't work out how you've imagined it because maybe that's the whole point of it as humans, we can never grasp that fully. We're never going to be able to show people exactly what we're able to to imagine in our heads and that that's okay yeah um you, you talked about the the whiskey brand uh, two stacks mm -hmm. and um i've seen the artwork um oh. and, and in many ways I, I never imagined i never imagined uh that a whiskey bottle could be a canvas you know but and i think this is a credit to you because i've never seen anything like that before it's exquisite it's absolutely Thank amazing you. um i mean when you think of traditional branding on whiskey bottles is quite dull, can be very boring. Uh, what you've done is is remarkable. Um, and I wanted to understand first and foremost, how was that relationship developed between them? And um, what does it look like going forward? Well, the guys at Two Sex, um, there's three um, guys that created that brand. Um, there's Shane and Liam and Dono. Now, Dono lives over in London, but the other two guys are local and they're from the Newry area. So what had actually happened was they got in contact with other people in Newry and said, hey, we want to keep our brand very local. We want our best to, you know, um, only hire, you know, artists and different people into the business to do these collaborations that are local which I thought was lovely so someone else had given them my name and said yep she could definitely do a mural for you so it started off that I was to do a mural um into the walkway of their warehouse that they were turning into um a sort of whiskey tasting experience they wanted visitors to be able to come in and see this really nice mural so I went up and I met the guys instantly got on with them they're lovely lovely guys and we created this concept for the mural. I painted it, thought it was a one-off job and that was fine. And then they got in contact with me again and they were like, hey, um, have you ever painted onto a bottle before? I was like, no, not really. And they were like, do you think you'd be able to, you know, create an artwork for our um, limited edition brand that we're doing? So they created these three liter Magnum bottles in a trilogy series and they kind of had them in gold, silver and bronze. And the whiskey in each of those was um, sort of, you know, a very limited edition cask and all the rest of it. And there was only going to be 55 bottles made in each colorway. So I said, yeah, that's no problem. Came in, sort of experimented with a few bottles and got this really cool pattern going on with a hydro dip and sort of played about with it a few more times and got it sort of spot on. So started off, did the trilogy. Um, they sold out in, I think, under a minute. So it was amazing. Closed that off again, thought it was a one-off job. And then the guys were like, you know what? People really, really want these. People are contacting us looking for more of this type of bottle. So we decided to collaborate and do a few other ones. We recently did. Um, it was called 
pump up the jam and it was a raspberry flavored cask. So I dipped half of the bottle. So only one side of it had the dip. And then on the other side, it was the clear glass. But when you look through the glass, you could see their logo in the background. So we did lots of little funky things like that. And I'm doing another collaboration with them again at Christmas. So um, they're really good when they do different events up there. They use uh, Finnegan and Son for the mm-hmm. catering. So they're always trying to keep it local in terms of people that they collaborate with, which is really nice. What, what's the artwork that you've produced that, that you're most proud of? Uh, that's a really tough one um, because there's lots of artworks that I've created that I haven't necessarily thought have been my best work, but they've been <clears throat> gifted to you know other people. I created them for like a certain person in mind, and that person has been so overwhelmed with joy when I've given it to them, and they show everybody this painting that I'm like, oh, that feeling nearly makes it you know the best artwork that I've I've created. So I don't know if I can compare any of my paintings per se and go, you know, I love this one more than the other um the other thing that i find is i am not traditional in terms of my artwork you could look at i'll give picasso for example and you'll know his style of painting the minute that you see it jackson pollock his splat you'll look at it and you'll say yeah that's definitely one of his paintings you could look at 15 different paintings of mine and you'd be like are they frankies because they're all so different and some of them could be quite abstract in nature um Some of them might be a little bit more traditional in the sense of what I'm actually painting. Some of them might be murals. Some of it could be dipped whiskey bottles. Um, So I don't have, I don't like to pigeonhole myself with a particular style. I like to sort of create what I'm feeling at the time for the client that I'm working with. Um, Because I want to have fun every time that I paint. I don't want to be known as the landscape painter that only paints, say, the Moran Mountains. Um, I want to, you know, Yes, okay, I can paint that, but I can also paint um, figurative female form and I can also do really mad acrylic pour with resin over the top. So I don't know if I actually have a favourite painting, Damien, sorry to say. (laughs) I ask that because obviously if you've been commissioned to do something, you're given direction on a certain task, but if it's something that you're doing for yourself, there's Mm -hmm. probably more, more emotionally invested in that painting. So I was wondering if in those instances, is there a more profound sense of achievement in that I love this, you know, whereas you're commissioned to do something as much as you enjoy it, it doesn't carry the same weight, you know? Do you know what? There's times, um, and hopefully I think other artists will agree, that when you're doing a commission piece for someone, it might not necessarily be exactly what you would be passionate about doing, Um and I'll actually use the guys at Two Stacks as an example. Painting the mural for them, great. Um, it was all these bricks that were busted through. And then through that, you can see their, their logo. And it was meant to be, you know, breaking down the old walls of the distillery and being able to see the sort of new age of whiskey. So that isn't something that I would have sat and painted for myself, obviously. But when I finished that, because it was a 3D mural and you could see every brick and you felt like you were walking through it and the bricks were even painted onto the floor in a 3D way, I stood back from that and I was like, I was really shocked. I was like, that's really good. And I was so (laughs) proud of myself for it. So there's times where you look at stuff and you're you're going, wow, I actually did that. I'm really proud of myself. Um, And when you are doing something that you love and you're painting it for yourself or you're painting it as a gift for, say, maybe a family member or a friend, um, I get that feeling, yes, I get it as I'm painting it, but I get it more so when I give it to them. And I know that they really love it because I've maybe created it with them in mind. And I know that they maybe love the ocean, so I've painted the ocean for them, or I've done something quite abstract in blue because I knew it was going to match in with their kitchen or their living room. And I've poured my heart and soul into it. Um, so I think it's the same feeling, but I get it in different in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, if I could move on, I wanted to understand, um, with, with respect to success, um, mm-hmm. obviously you can probably compartmentalize your, yourself in so much as that there's one aspect of the artist, um, you do work for yourself and you're also the businesswoman. Um, mm-hmm. so there's probably many means by which you can measure your success, but 
the older I've got, and I'm probably a little bit older than you, certainly I look at, <laughs> um, it's, I, I've, I see success more as a, as a feeling within myself rather than by any metric by which you can be measured. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so yes, it's been a commercial success, but it might not give you, a, it might not necessarily give you a sense of contentment looking mm-hmm. at or, or success in that way. Um, what about you? How, how do you measure success and, and what ultimately satisfies you when, when you've done something? Well, I think for me, the success, success changes at, you know, different points throughout my personal life and also obviously through the longevity, hopefully, um, in the business. At the start, success for me was opening the studio. The Mm -hmm. success for me now is filling the studio um, and obviously making sure that every year I'm making more money than the year before before. And that's obviously because costs have gone up and everything goes up. So you obviously want to be making more than the previous year. So that is obviously success for me in that term. Um, But then I find success in, again, say having school kids coming in. We had kids in yesterday with 30 of them in for a workshop and it was seeing them all leaving with their canvas and they had a big massive smile on them. So that to me is on a personal level success because I'm thinking do you know what you brought this here this didn't exist before you came back to Ireland and you've created this and you've now let 30 little children walk out of your studio with a big massive smile on their face so that gives me this like massive sense of success that I've done something really right um obviously it's great as well that this year and not to brag but I have been on (laughs) four holidays this year that never happened before because one I would never have got the time off work no employer would have said yeah oh you want to go on a fourth holiday sure go for it (laughs) would never ever happen um and I work extremely hard like I work seven days a week whether I'm in the studio or not I'm obviously self-employed so I do everything within my business and I have to be constantly on top of that um so to be able to take four holidays even if they're only a week each that to me is success because I feel very well off to be able to do that. Um, you know, that that to me is like something that I only thought I could do if I retired. So when I was working in Australia and I was doing crazy 60 hour weeks, I thought, yeah, when I retire, I'll be able to take multiple holidays a year, whereas now I'm able to do it in my fourth year of business. So, um, yeah, that's definitely success. Obviously, you, you talked about opening this studio, I think, just over a year ago. And mm-hmm. that's amidst a, a, an economic crisis, a cost of living crisis. Um, what were some of the fears, you know, in taking that step? I think, um, obviously, no one else had done what I'm doing in terms of a paint and workshop studio space that... Um, pulled in all these different cohorts in the community so I was in a panic of is this going to work or is it going to fall flat on its face it's all well and good doing it when you have the security of your job and you're running a class once or twice a week but when you're in there and you're obviously have your rent to pay and your your rates bills are coming in and you're obviously buying a lot of product in to be able like your canvases and your paints to be able to facilitate multiple workshops every month I think the fear was you know what if this doesn't work out and I end up in a lot of debt um I end up having to go back with my tail between my legs and go and work in a job again and I think in reality nobody really cares if I end up having to go back and work in a job that's all on me that's all in my head no one no one gives two hoots but there was that sort of panic about it and I just thought you know what if I let these thoughts consume me and take over I'll never get anything done I'll never sign the lease I'll never move into the studio. So I just thought, just keep going for it and add value to people's lives in terms of the workshop. So yes, we're in a cost of living crisis. We were in the midst of a pandemic when I opened. um, There was all the restrictions. But I thought, you know what? Keep the workshop price the same as it was prior. Just because I've opened a studio doesn't mean that I'm now going to add that cost on to, you know, my client. Keep the price the same. Um, but add value to it and the value was in the workshop itself people coming in and making connections we get a lot of people that come in on their own every month to do it they've made different friendships that come every month now and 
again, as I said, that interpersonal getting to know people, getting to have a chat with them before the class starts and after the class ends. And so, yeah, I think, I think that was it. You've you've kind of touched upon what I was going to talk about next, and I've taken a lot of it from the previous interview you'd done on another podcast. Um, I'd read an article, and it was from the Telegraph, and it talks about a charity called Arts and Minds. I think it's in the U- in the UK. Yeah, um, it's a mental health charity or an arts and mental health charity in Cambridgeshire. Um, so they had the project called Arts uh, on Prescription Project. Uh, this was run over the course of seven years. They run work- workshops similar to yourself. Um, mm-hmm. it, a very inclusive thing. You know, it helped people, you know, um, that were lonely, suffering with depression, anxiety. And I've never really, I mean, I've always been aware of the fact that art can be used as therapy. Mm-hmm. But I suppose I, I always imagined that it would be used in very specific circumstances and not necessarily able to be prescribed to, to the wider community just for mm-hmm. general general health and well-being. But, I mean, they saw a 71% decrease in feelings of anxiety, 73% fall in depression, 76% of participants felt that um, their general well-being had been increased, 96% felt that they were socially included. You've used your studio as a platform to do much more than just make art available. I mean, mm-hmm. art ultimately is a byproduct of what, what you've done. You know, you've created a space where people can meet one another, become friends. And I think that's the greater reward that you've made available to people, um, which I think is a remarkable thing. Talk to me about some of the benefits of art. Uh, I mean, I've obviously touched upon some of it, but from, mm-hmm. from, from, from your experience. Well, the studies have actually shown that art has the same effect on the brain as meditating. So it calms down your nervous system, your brain waves. And that's why people talk about when they paint, they get into a flow state because it just completely detaches you from all those thoughts that are, you know, in your head 24 seven and just really relaxes the nervous system. So we have done like a lot of workshops and I'm very clear to say that I'm not an art therapist. That's obviously a very specialized person that goes off and, and does that training. Um, and people, you know, get a, their sort of degree in art therapy. So they're obviously a different type of person that will sit down with someone that has, you know, post-traumatic stress, that sort of thing. And they work in a more clinical environment. However, we use art as therapy um, in a, a broader term. So we do get a lot of community groups come in over COVID as well. We connected with, um, we had ladies groups in South Armagh that didn't have access to arts didn't have access to coming into a studio we sent them out packs we did everything online we got them talking about the old times what they used to do when you know they were in their early 20s and um, we created art around that they made lovely tote bags that they designed all of that sort of thing so we're trying to be as inclusive as possible and I think it even says it on the website as well that we catered all cohorts that we wanted to make it inclusive. We wanted art not to be for like this, you know, small little segment of the art community. It was open and welcome to everybody. And um, art, like we've used art in a lot of settings. It can be used in hospice settings, not just for patients that are obviously at the end of life, but also for their families. Um, my grandmother used to work in Uri Hospice and used to do a lot of art with patients in there and create little books for them that the patients would create that would ultimately be used and given to the family to sort of process through things at the end we have used art with kids and children in foster care to bring them together and with other children in foster care but also with their new foster families to be able to create those relationships and people see it as we're coming in to paint but they don't realize that whilst they're in there, they're forming friendships and relationships. And um, they're sort of, you know, calming themselves down, painting and chatting away. And it sort of comes hand in hand because the minute that you start painting, especially if you're in one of our classes where you're having a glass of wine, you start turning around to the person next to you and you're chatting away and you start to find out different things about different people. We bring children in nursery ages. We've worked with a lot of nurseries, working on their little fine motor skills for their hands. Children that can't express things in words that they're able to get that out on paper or create it in terms of clay and making different things. So it's a multifunctional space in that regard. Um, And it does bring groups together, brings individuals together. 
I'm, and it's just a nice space to be able to relax and unwind. I would imagine that has to be equally as rewarding as, as the sale of any painting or any commercial success is that you see those friendships and relationships form and you see people leave ultimately satisfied that they've created something when they've never done it perhaps since high school. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when we talk about success, I, I'd seen that you've been shortlisted for Young Businesswoman of the Year. Your mm -hmm. art studio had been shortlisted for um, Best Innovative innovative business but mm -hmm. I also I also seen something that you posted uh, on your LinkedIn and it relates to school children and some of the the feedback that, it, that they give to you I mean if I take one in particular one little girl I would imagine I think it's a girl she said you have been such an inspiration to not just me but everyone in the class you really are an amazing role model where does that sit alongside um, being shortlisted for any award well, I actually have that little a note framed that the child um, wrote. So that was during our summer camp this year, actually, um, on the very last day. So they're in from a Monday to a Friday. And it's about 25 children. And they all went around. They had an art book at the start of the week and all of their sort of little drawings and design work. So we would start off with design work in it and then they would go and create the other stuff outside of that. So it was, it was quite funny. It was almost like an end of year book. They were all going around and they were like signing their names in each other's books. And they come up to me and they were saying, Frankie, will you put your name in my book? And I said, yeah, well. And then I could see them all huddled in a corner and they were scribbling stuff out. And they had come up with this little letter. And one girl, Katie, presented it to me. And I was like, oh, I nearly started crying. I was like, this is so lovely. Because I thought, do you know what? I was that kid at one point. And my mum was the art teacher for me that really mm. sort of inspired me, right? Because I just looked at my mum when she was running those classes and I thought, this is the best thing ever. And I want to do this when I'm older. And this is the coolest thing ever. And those kids are the same. They haven't hit secondary school yet. And they don't have that fear of creating something, of being told you're not good at art or maybe art's not your thing. Try something different. These kids are told, what you're doing is great and keep doing it and let's add to it and let's get, you know, be more fun with what we're painting and let's make a mess because my studio, you can make a mess. doesn't matter if there's paint on the walls and paint on the floor. That is the whole point of it. So when I got that, um, it meant so much to me that I actually did. I just took a photo of it and I put it up on LinkedIn, but I also framed it as well because I just thought it was amazing. Yeah, I think those things speak as much to you as a person as being shortlisted for any award, that that human element that you've touched someone enough that they think that much of you. Um, I also seen with regard, I mean, I think you've been incredible in so much as art has been a platform to do so much good. I mean, you talked about uh, facilitating foster families in your studio, mm -hmm. you know, you talked about other community groups. Uh, I seen on International Women's Day, you did a live painting and then you mm -hmm. auctioned it off, all of which went um, to the charity. How much or how important is it that art allows you to do all those things? Well, I think not necessarily just art, but I think anyone that's in business of any shape or form, if you're able to give back in some way, um, then do it. And do you know what it is? A lot of people aren't in a position to give back and that's okay mm -hmm. that's totally fine um sometimes and i think social media is great for it for the people that aren't able to financially give back or creatively give back that they share someone's post or they share about a charity and they get the word out and that's that's enough for me i thought you know what I have a talent here i'm able to create something at my fingertips and why not create a painting and auction it off and do some good you know, so it's, I said it earlier, money isn't the driving force, never has been, never will be for the business. It's a byproduct of what I do. So if I'm able to create something and make a difference um, in someone's life, donate it towards charity um, and raise some essential funds for it was women um, in need, like that ultimately is the main goal. If you can help other people, we're not all going to be here forever. So you got to help along the way. Um, I certainly couldn't have even set up my business on my own. I've had a lot of help along the way from people. So I know that's a lot different to a charity, but I think help other people. People will help you do your best as much as you can. Um, 
and yeah where possible if you're a business owner just try and give back mm -hmm. that's commendable i mean I, i've i suppose in the last year there was a quote that i read from muhammad ali and he essentially said that service to others is the rent that you pay for your room here on earth um mm -hmm. which has always stuck with me and I think as much as I want to be successful in anything I do, I'm equally balanced in that I want to help as just as much. Um, and I think that makes you a better person. Um, I want to talk about who's influenced you the most. And I don't necessarily mean artwork. I mean, mm -hmm. as a person, who's had the biggest impact and who's inspired you the most? I think uh, my family unit as a whole has probably been the biggest inspiration. Um, I've got three other sisters. The youngest is only not long out of university, but she's quite entrepreneurial already. And my other two sisters own their own businesses. So I think there's obviously a trait within all of us that um, that was sort of the go-to that we're all going to end up having our own business at some point. And I think that ultimately comes from my parents giving us the freedom to sort of do what we wanted to do. We weren't constricted in any shape or form. It was like, yeah, you enjoy art, go do art. You enjoy music, go and, you know, create some music, that sort of thing. Um, and from that, we had the freedom to just try everything out. You know, we, we weren't constricted in any way. But I think there's also that underlying sibling rivalry and competitiveness. Nobody talks about it, but it's there. It's definitely underlying. It's like, oh, you're doing really well. I also need to, <laughs> to you know, up my game and do really well you can't be the one in the family that hasn't hit the mark so and it's all in a very healthy way so I think that that has influenced me and shaped me um and I come from a, a very good and supportive family and even the wider family network if you think of you know grandparents and cousins and they've all been aunts very supportive even when I um opened the studio I have an aunt who has a business just a few doors up okay. and she was running down with She's like, oh, I've got an extra kettle and I've got mugs and I've got this. And she's like, I have a mop for you. And they might sound like silly things, but it's all that sort of element of community and family that supports you and drives you and shapes who you are as a person. So I think that my family have been the driving influence in who I am and what I've decided to do. That's wonderful. Um, I think and if opportunity allows it, if if the space becomes available, I think your sisters and those in your family that have a business should all have a business on the same street. <laughs> it would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> we could just yeah. all take over the same street. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you could rename it Bannon Street or something. Bannon you know? Street. I'd love that. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> you could be honest just, something that came in. Just, just putting that out there. Um, what, what do you hope that your artwork says about you? As in like a legacy, if, if I'm leaving one behind or just if someone's bought it at the minute and they're... Well, both I would imagine, like, you know, obviously with the likes of abstract, then that's a, a, another question because I ultimately want to understand what you put into an abstract. Obviously it's left uh, in many ways for the person that looks at it to interpret. Mm -hmm. And very often I would imagine they would miss the mark because how are they to know what you've ultimately looked to achieve? But yeah, if just someone looking at the body of work that you've you've created, if it was if there was an underlying narrative about what you've done, and obviously you've said that all of your artwork's very different and you're very versatile, but if they were to take something away from from your art, what would you hope that it be? I think when my art is in any space, so if it's in someone's home or it's in a gallery, I want a person to obviously feel some level of a connection to it, and it should drive some sort of feeling for them. Now, the feeling might not always be good, okay? It's like you go in, you've gone into art galleries and you've probably seen a painting and you're going, really? That's up on the wall? Some people might go, that's crap. Well, I could do that, right? But it, it's driving some sort of a emotion in them and it's pulling that emotion out of them. So I would hope that people would look at my artwork and feel quite happy when they look at my paintings. There's a lot of bright color in a lot mm -hmm. of my artwork. And that's typically because I'm a very happy, upbeat person. And I, when I'm thinking of getting that feeling out of my body and onto a canvas, it is very bright. So I would hope that if someone has one of my paintings up on their walls, that they feel that it brightens up their space and it gives them a sense of happiness or peace. 
Um, I'm really hoping that nobody looks at it and goes, that's totally crap and I don't like it. But look, that probably does happen too. Um, I hope that when, you know, in years to come, when I may be long gone and my artwork is hopefully still circulating around and being handed from person to person, I just hope that somebody looks at it, feels joy from it, and it maybe gives them a little glimpse into my life and who I am as a person and they can feel that sense of joy of who I was as a person on a canvas. I think that's ultimately what every artist is trying to leave behind is a little piece of themselves. Hmm. Um, is there a point which, and I'm not sure if this has happened, um, but is there a point at which you would showcase your work uh, in a gallery for Yuri, for example? Yeah, so the, the plan was uh, at some point that I, first of all, it was going to be a year opening of the studio space and I was going to pull everything out of it and for one week turn it into a gallery space that would have my own artwork and that was going to be the thing. Business has been so busy, which is great, um, and I don't want to change that. I've just not had a chance to even sit down and create a full body of work. Then in between that, I've been doing commissions for people, the whiskey bottles, murals, different things. So it's definitely on the cards. It is going to happen. Um, there are quite a few large scale pieces that I'm working on at the minute. Um, I don't like showing anybody my artwork until it's finished. I'm ha like I, I'm working on process videos of creating stuff because I know a lot of people are really intrigued about how a final paintings created. So I have been working on a few process videos. Um, but there definitely will be a point when there will be a gallery space and there'll be a showing of my body of work. Um, the plan will be to have it in my studio in Uri for a week or two and then potentially in a gallery in Belfast or Dublin. Um, and then ultimately it'll be up on the website as well to buy whatever's left in terms of originals and prints. But it's just trying to find the time, Damien, in between running a very busy business. So, Yeah, I can imagine. I was, I was going to ask, do you even sleep? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so right now, obviously, when you're, when you're starting a business, you know, it, it requires an awful lot of commitment to get it up and running to make it sustainable. Um, mm -hmm. But right now, I would imagine the balance is tilted one way or certainly leans more toward the business than your own your own artwork. Uh, if I could talk about your own artwork, um, have you ever received criticism and, and how do you deal with criticism? Yeah, I've definitely received criticism. Um, I think one of the things about art is a lot of the time if people don't like it, they're not going to tell you to your face. They're probably going to tell you to someone else and say, oh, I don't think that was very good. Um, the criticism that I have had recently was actually from my grandmother so I think a lot of elderly people get to a certain point where they're like you know what I, I'm not going to mince my words if I don't like something I'm going to tell you that I don't like yeah. it so I was showing her a few paintings and she was like no no that that doesn't seem right and I don't like that part of it and I don't like this bit of it and I'm thinking oh god All right, okay um but do you know what it's good to get that feedback because as I said most people don't give it to you directly to your face so I did re-look at the painting and I thought, okay, yeah, maybe she has a point with that. Um, other times, maybe not. Um, that's okay too. But I think the biggest critic that I have is probably myself. Um, and I think most creatives can relate to that. that. You know, sometimes you can really cripple yourself with self-doubt. You can look at something and go, that is rubbish. That is the worst thing I've ever created. But again, that's okay. Because as long as you're creating, you're moving forward. Mm -hmm. you know you're not going backwards you're moving forward in it because you'll learn what doesn't work you'll learn how to do it better and then sometimes through messing something up you will actually create a really good piece and that happened to me recently so um i don't know if you saw it on my instagram but there was a, a figurative painting of a woman's body and it was called it's all out in the open and her face has a big splat of paint over it and then there's words written all over her body that started off as an oil painting that i did of um a woman's body but her face was in it and i sort of was working on the face and i messed it up and i looked at it and thought mm, i really don't like that but i quite like the body that I had painted and I thought I don't want to chuck it out 
going to keep working on it. And I had a, a red background as well. And I thought, mm, the red's too jarring. So I got the palette knife out and I started putting gray into the background and building up texture. And then I got the pencil out and I started writing words all over her body and trying to do them in the shape and folds of her skin. And I didn't like the face. So I just went and I filled up a dustpan with um, white and black paint and I splatted it and poured it across her face. And it worked out to be a really good piece. So um, you don't always have to stop when the painting turns out a bit rubbish. You can sometimes push through it as well. That's pretty cool that even though that you essentially know what you're hoping to achieve, that painting and, and art can still amaze and surprise even you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which it must be an exciting and, and wonderful feeling. Uh, I have just a couple more questions. Um, mm -hmm. As it relates to art, and, and I understand what you've done um, in, in making art much more accessible to people and creating a space, but uh, I wanted to understand, is art affordable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, art can be affordable. Um, I mean, obviously, the bigger an artist gets, the bigger their name gets. Um, obviously, the price of their work ultimately mm -hmm. goes up. Um, and then there's always that old adage of the fact that, you know, you don't create any money as an artist until you're dead. <laughs> and your artwork <laughs> worth a fortune. It's no use to you then. Uh, which I think times have shifted immensely in that now that, you know, artists are making a lot of money from their work. But, for example, I could have a painting that's £1,200 for the original painting, which it's expensive to some people. It's not, you know, extortionately expensive for an original piece. But then I also create limited edition prints of that artwork. So there might be 100 or 200 of that created into a print. And they could vary from maybe £350 right down to £50, depending on the artwork, the size, if it's framed, that sort of thing. So art can definitely be affordable. I think if you look at it, if you were to spend £150 on a limited edition print and you know that you've got one of 100 of those prints, Ultimately, it will go up in value as the artist's profile raises in value and the more art that they create and the more exposure that they get. So it can be an investment, even as a limited edition print. Or obviously, if you're going to spend the £800, £1,000, £2,000 on an original painting, that in years to come could be an investment worth you know, £40,000, £50,000. Then again, it might not. The artwork might just retain its value you could sell it on for what you paid for it, or you might just hand it down to someone. But art can be seen as an investment piece um, if you have the money to spend, or you can get affordable pieces in terms of limited edition prints. So there really is a lot out there for people. Um, Etsy as well I have some really good artists on it as well that create some affordable pieces. I just wanted to finish, and I'd watched a, a motivational video. I think it was by Eric Thomas. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's called mm -hmm. the hip-hop the hip preacher, but he's immensely passionate. And, I mean, the five minutes after I've watched the video, I, I feel the need that I – or certainly I have the feeling that I could physically do anything. I mean, that mm -hmm. qu quite quickly subsides, and I end up just lying on the couch with a cup of tea eating cookies. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but he had basically said um, that diamonds are created under pressure. Mm -hmm. um, you've been through an awful lot and you've taken some pretty big risks in that you've left a career that you'd been in you know um, you'd taken the plunge and come home you'd mm -hmm. done something that nobody else had effectively done in Yuri and creating your own space um, would you change anything or do you think all of those experiences and hardships that you've been through have ultimately made, made this possible yeah, I wouldn't change anything. I mean, I'd love to have done it sooner, but I wouldn't have been ready to do it sooner. So I think it is that hindsight's obviously a great thing. You can look back and connect all the dots and go, oh yeah, that crappy job got me into this job or that, you know, that relationship broke down for this to work out or, you know, whatever it is at the time where you think that life's not going your way. It ultimately, when you look back, has made you a stronger or better or more developed person. I never thought when I started a career as an area manager in a 
a retail company that I was going to end up back in my hometown as an artist running workshops. It, the two just seemed so disjointed. But yeah, when I look back, it seems like that there was no way that it couldn't have worked out the way that it did. Um, so yeah, I think pressure and life in general, you know, it's just, it's going to happen to you. And I think it's how you deal with what life throws at you. Nobody has an easy life, no matter mm -hmm. who they are. We all have got our crosses to bear, things that have happened. You can let it get you down. You can let it overwhelm you or you can push through it and you can find the little glimmers of hope in it and the little glimmers of motivation that are going to drive you and push you forward. And I think if you have that passion, you have a goal in mind and you keep that in the forefront, you'll get there. It might not be in the way that you thought it was going to be. Like how I've set up my business over the last four years, if I went back and looked at my business plan, I think I'd probably laugh my head off because they're so vast, very different. I thought I was going to start off doing acrylic pour workshops. No one else had done it. And that was going to be the thing that was, you know, going to make my mark out there. And it wasn't. It ended up being the paint and set workshops. It ended up being, you know, birthday parties and hen parties and corporate events and all these fun activities that we do. And then that obviously started working into the community uh, workshops and working with children and all of these different you know, sides of the business that you you can't imagine. You just have to take one step forward and just keep going with it and you'll get there in the end. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's it's clear to be seen from, from your story. I mean, when you, and I wasn't aware of the fact that your mother had done art workshops 25 mm -hmm. years ago. That ultimately left an impression upon you and it's something you've carried forward. And I think it's helped create and shape the business that you have. I think that's remarkable that 25 years on here you are effectively doing the same thing um, yeah. and that your mother and what she had done has had that impact on you. Um, just lastly, with respect to art, how difficult is it to find a space for yourself? Because there's a lot of artists, you know, to, and, you know, I mean, when you look at the likes of Bank Banksy, for example, mm -hmm. a, a large part of the allure or appeal there is that we don't know who that person is. You know, that's, mm -hmm. His niche, obviously, he's a, he's a very incredible and accomplished artist, but the added element is, who is he? Do you have to create something about yourself in order that you have that appeal, or should your artwork just ultimately speak for itself? I think it's a little bit of both. Obviously, in the current sort of world that we live in, being very visual, everything being very online, and people want to have that point of difference. So Banksy's obviously point of difference is, you know, nobody knows who he is and, and that makes the allure of it even um, greater. But ultimately your artwork needs to speak to people. Yes, people will now buy Banksy's work or photograph his work because it is a Banksy. Um, prior to that, people just obviously thought of it as graffiti on the street and probably would have walked past it. So there is a little bit of both. But I think... It's a saturated market, but I feel like every market nowadays because of the internet is saturated. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if someone wants to be a, a makeup artist, there's millions of girls doing it um, and guys as well. So people are saying, well, how do you make yourself different? I think what you have to do is be true to yourself, follow what excites you, and then you will draw like a magnet the same people into you. So as I said, there'll be people that won't resonate with my art, there'll be other people that will look at my art and be like, that's exactly what I've been looking for. I needed someone to create that. So it's like, see a need, fill a need. Create what you want to create. You will ultimately pull those people in. They'll want to buy your artwork. Not everybody's going to want to buy my artwork. Not even everybody wants or likes artwork. Some people mm -hmm. want their homes, you know, minimalistic, bare, nothing on the walls. So I think there's no point racking your brains about trying to create a persona for yourself that everybody's going to want to like. And everybody, you know, it's going to, you're not trying to attract everybody. You're trying to attract a small amount of people that are your people. So I think just be yourself, be authentic, create the artwork that you want to create and then challenge yourself. Don't challenge it for making money to say, right, well, this artist does figurative paintings, for example. I'm going to follow their style. They have a massive following, I'm going to do what they're doing. No, because that's them. That's not mm -hmm. you. 
So create what you want to create and then look at your own artwork and go, how can I make this better? How can I challenge myself? What if I was to destroy that painting and do this to it and do that to it? It's like me putting the splat of paint over her face. Wasn't my intent to do that at the beginning. But then I thought to myself, you know what? I don't like this painting. How can I stretch it? How can I destroy it and then rebuild it and do something else? And then you create something unique to you from that. And then the, there was a woman that found my painting um, who's a clinical psychologist and she messaged me and she said, I was looking for something exactly like that. And I just came across it on your Instagram page and she's like, I have to buy it. So that's just how it works. I think you just create and those people will come along anyway. They'll find you. I just watched um, Jordan Peterson and he was mm -hmm. talking he was talking about artwork and he said, um, I don't know that it relates to our society and, and where we're from, but again, this is coming from a clinical psychologist's point of view, but he said no one's buying artwork and people are afraid of their life of putting artwork up in their homes anymore because it ultimately leaves them feeling exposed and revealing too much about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that to be true. I mean, in my experience, people are more indulged and willing to buy artwork. Um, you can probably um, relate to that because certainly your business has taken off. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I have a brother-in-law that does something as well in the art, in the art space. He makes, uh, you know, a healthy income. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, I mean, is there any part of that, that that you could relate to or agree with? I don't know. I've not experienced it myself. Maybe Jordan Peterson might be pertaining to people that are putting up artwork that is more controversial, potentially. Okay. Maybe if it's heading on, you know, racial or gender issues or anything societal that's going to evoke a reaction into somebody to say, well, why have you got that up there? Maybe in that term, that's okay, what yeah. he might be talking about. But for the most part, no, I, when anyone buys artwork from me, it's normally, they'll say, oh my God, that is what I've been looking for. That's what I need. Um, or this is beautiful. Does it come in another color? Cause I need it to match my, my kitchen, my living room, whatever. And um, it's that kind of thing of people say like the paint and speaks to them. Like, yep, yeah, they want to have that. I mean, if you're going to have an artwork on your wall, you're going to be looking at that every day that you walk into that space so it needs to be something that you connect with you don't want to walk in and look at a painting and be like oh god I absolutely detest that because you take it off the wall in seconds so I think when somebody buys an original piece or obviously a limited edition print they're really saying to you you know I love what you've created otherwise they're not going to even if it's only 50 quid they're not going to part with their money to put that up on their wall or give that as a gift to someone. Mm -hmm. Just one last question, and I'm sorry mm -hmm. if I'm, I'm no, taking you too fine. long. Um, I've obviously written different things from poetry to, to prose to I attempted a play at one point. Um, but I, I, I very often find that, that what I write only lives with me for a short, a relatively short period of time before I need to not revisit it anymore because mm -hmm. it's lived with me for a prolonged period of time i'm emotionally you know mentally invested in it um i'm all too familiar with it and then i don't i wouldn't look to read it ever again because mm -hmm. is there any part of that tree of art and your art or each and every time you see it does it still evoke no i think uh that's quite true for my own artwork and I think that's why my artwork doesn't have a particular style because I will get so invested in the piece that I'm working in and I'll create it and then it's like I've satisfied that need I'm, I've done it I'm okay with it now the nice thing is there are certain paintings especially paintings I have in my own home of my own artwork that I do look at and I'm like oh I really I do really like that that painting even though I've done it myself I'm like I do really like that um, and then there's other times where if I've obviously gifted a painting or I've sold a painting and I haven't seen it in a very long time it could be years that have passed and then I see it in someone's home it brings it all back and I'm like oh wow yeah I got it or I look at it and I say oh it's so different from the style of painting that I'm doing at the minute so I don't necessarily need to go back and constantly re revisit pieces that I've created. Um, and I feel that that's why I don't like creating the same types of paintings over and over and over again. I think that's why I couldn't, again, paint like a landscape, 
you know, painting repetitively, I don't think it would excite me very much to continuously do the same sort of painting. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers that. Yeah. And my interest in art has always only ever been really abstract. I've, I've had no <laughs> interest in, in landscape. Um, and I, I kind of asked that earlier. I mean, when you put an abstract piece together, do you have a clear defined narrative or underlying story? And do you do it with the understanding that more times than not, people won't get what you've ultimately set out to achieve? Yeah, well, I mean, it depends because sometimes when I'm creating an abstract piece, it, the motivation behind that could be music. So I might be listening to a certain type of genre of music and it's getting me really fired up. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to create something that basically gets that feeling out onto canvas. So it doesn't have, an, it's not a, a painting of anything in particular, okay. it's painting of a feeling um music of that sort of thing and I do like to try and write them on the back of the canvas so if I have created something abstract I will sometimes put on it what music I was listening to okay. or what the sort of motivation was there and um, there could be sometimes when I do an abstract style of something so again if it's a, a figurative body if it's the ocean but it's in a more abstract way the color schemes that I've used, you'll sort of know by looking at it, I would think you would say, yeah, that really does seem like a big body of water, a lot of ocean or the color sort of draws that through. But I think abstract ultimately is there open to interpretation. And that's the nice part about it, because you can have an abstract piece in your home and it's a conversational piece. People will come up and look at it and stare at it and think, what is that? And then you might say, well, what do you think it is? And then they might say, well, I can see this in it. And you, you say, oh, I never saw that before. And it really opens up a conversation. It's kind of like looking at clouds where you're like, oh, I can make this out of it. I can make that out of it. So I think that's one part of it. And then the other part is it can just give you pure happiness and joy, mm -hmm. especially with bright color. As I said, I use a lot of bright colors in, in my artwork. If I'm doing a massive abstract piece and it's on a very plain wall, I want the person to come into that space and they don't have to find a, a, a picture within the painting. They just have to look at it and go, that's really cool. Or that makes me feel really happy. And that ultimately is the goal for me when I'm creating an abstract piece. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to go back and revisit something that you said with respect to your grandmother and mm -hmm. the fact the fact that she she's probably earned the right not to have a filter anymore because yeah. I think what, and the same can be said of my grandparents. I used to... Um, they lived about 50 yards in front of us. Mm -hmm. So we had quite a co close relationship, but you could rest assured that when you went to visit, my grandmother will say what she sees, um, mm -hmm. which more often than not left you feeling shitty about yourself and leaving depressed because the first thing <laughs> she would say is, Jesus, or, you know, something to the effect of God, son, have you put on weight? <laughs> and you've gone out feeling fucking this small. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's one of my lasting memories of my grandmother. Um, <laughs> So with respect to the business, where can people find uh, the studio and what's what's uh, in the future? What can yeah. we look forward to? So um, if anyone's looking to find out about the studio, we've got a website, which is artstudio, the number 23.co.uk. You can obviously find it on Facebook and Instagram as well. And we're based in Upper Water Street in Uri, 26 Upper Water Street. So for anyone that's not familiar with street names in Uri. It's where across the road from the bank bar and around the corner from Finnegan and Sun Cafe, just off Sugar Island. Um, in terms of the business, we're just going to keep doing more workshops. We've started doing workshops now in Belfast as well. So we are collaborating with Haymarket and um, Belfast, uh, the bar up there, um, just down from the cast from Castle Court. So once a month, we will be doing paint and sip workshops in there on a Friday night. And we're going to start to grow the client base up there and just sort of see what happens. Now, we do have, have a bigger plan for the business probably in about three to five years' time, but I'm not telling anybody about that yet. But there is quite a big um, business plan for that. And then in terms of my own artwork, people can find that on my website, which is separate to it, which is Frankie B., .co.uk and you can find obviously all of my artwork um prints limited editions all that kind of stuff's there or again 
you can find uh, Frankie B Art on Instagram and Facebook and people can contact me there for commissions and inquiries. So um, there will be for the future for my own artwork, as I said, a gallery space and getting um, an exhibition going once I get the time, Damien, of course, in between all these big plans. So, yeah. so just for anybody that wants to find you, it's Upper Water Street, soon to be Bannon Street. Is that uh... soon to be Bannon Street? Yeah, you've coined it first. You've heard it here first. I'm going to start a petition. Um... <laughs> change the name. <laughs> I, I, I think you've, you've earned the right to change the street name. Uh, Frankie, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I've not had the privilege to meet you before, but um, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Same, Damien. Thank you so much for um, having me on the podcast. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks. Enjoy your day.